So I'm Sheldon Rothblatt, and I'm a Professor of History Emeritus uh, at Berkeley, and I was also a Director of the Center for Studies in Higher Education on this campus. I was a second. I have been at Berkeley since, uh, as a faculty member since 1963, and I was here before uh, as a student. And so, in a sense, although I've been elsewhere, lots of places, particularly since retirement and taught elsewhere, Berkeley has, was my home from the time I was uh, uh, 17 and a half years old. The aesthetics, the music, the learning, all of that in my 18-year-old mind combined to make Berkeley just a new world, a new vision. Nothing else mattered for me in those years but what the campus had to offer. So these photographs bring that back to me. And they're also the world that Clark Kerr loved. Now, everything I sele selected in a way, or just about everything, has to do with Kerr. Because I've been thinking a lot about him and writing about him and talking to you about him, everything that I'm thinking about with respect to this university and how it became and what it was is all collected to Kerr. So I'm seeing the world not only through my youthful eyes, but in a way through him. He loved this campus. It was difficult in a way uh, to say that for the man who was responsible for, principally responsible for decentralizing the campus and creating the multi-campus system as we know it, but he really fell in love with this campus. He wasn't just a president of this university, he was a man who was emotionally and in, intimately emotionally involved with it and I don't want that feature to be lost in, the, in all the discussions of him as the social scientist, managerial person, social engineering. Yes, that's one part of his life but it is not the whole part of his life and if we want to recapture that man you have to get it whole, you have to get it all. The history of great universities indicates that they continue to be great but they go through ups and downs, and that has to be recognized. So when you're living in a down, it becomes quite depressing. The financial crisis at the moment, but it was the loyalty oath crisis before, it was the student demonstration of the 1960s before. All of those were perceived as crises at the time, and in a way they were. So you have to ask yourself, how did the university survive? How did it surround it? How did it bounce back? Because there is inherent in the history of a great university desire to find a way now, I may stumble in finding that way, but eventually there, there come people, enough of them, and it can't be just one, who recognize that there's something inherent in the institution that must be preserved and furthered, even if new, uh, new plans, new ideas about it have to be done. Nobody knows where higher education is going in the United States of the world, except that it's highly competitive for talent, that it is going to be involved in society in all sorts of ways in order to get the support and the money that it needs. Those have strengths and those have dangers. What you want are people who understand what the tensions and pressures are, will resolve to balance them in some sort of fruitful way. It's a question of leadership. Nobody can define academic leadership. Nobody could define it. I've read books on it, I've had to review books on it. They're a yawner, okay? Put you to sleep. Uh, nobody knows who the leader is, the combination of things. Uh, Kerr was a, a visionary, but he also had, he was a shy man. And in a sense, his predecessor, Robert Gordon Sproul, was more successful in reaching the alumni and reaching out. They loved Sproul, he had a booming voice and he was a gregarious type of person. Clark was more reticent and so on. Um, what does it take to be a leader? Uh, what kind of combination of intellectual insight and personality qualities? Don't know. But you have to have on a campus like Berkeley or any other great campus leadership that is not only central but also diffuse. You have to have a faculty that wants the place to really succeed. And you have to have a faculty that wants the place to succeed in more than personal terms. Not just because they gain by it, but because it's good for the whole. I always worry about academic selfishness. You have to have a sense of the whole, the whole place. I think that there's enough 
in the tradition of Berkeley and maybe the other campuses of the university to be able to draw on that, but it has to be taught. It has to be discussed. It has to be explained. Even if a vision cannot be defined exactly, you have to do, I think, what you have done. You have to bring people together who will recognize that even talking about a vision that you can't define is better than never talking about it at all. You'll never be able to explain exactly what you need. But if you say repeatedly, we need legacy, the legacy has to be related to a vision, the legacy has to be there, but it can change and adapt. If you just have groups of people who come and say that, then emotionally the commitment to the campus will build up somehow psychologically. So you don't have to be precise, but you have to care.